our scriptures this morning from the book of St. Luke, chapter 11, verses 29 through 32, and 1 Peter, chapter 4, verse 17. From the 11th chapter, the book of St. Luke, the 29th through the 32nd verses, we shall find these words. Jesus began to say, this is an evil generation. They seek a sign, and there shall no sign be given it, but the sign of Jonah the prophet. For as Jonah was a sign unto the Ninevites, so shall also the Son of Man be to this generation. The queen of the south shall rise up in the judgment with the men of this generation and condemn them. For she came from the utmost parts of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon. And behold, a greater than Solomon is here. The men of Nineveh shall rise up in the judgment with this generation and shall condemn it, for they repented at the preaching of Jonah. And behold, a greater than Jonah is here. First Peter chapter 4 verse 17, for the time is come that justice must begin at the house of God. And if it first begin with us, what shall the end be of them that obey not the gospel of God? For a few moments, let us reason together from this subject, a kingdom advocate for justice, a kingdom advocate for justice. We are grateful to God for this wonderful day in which we as a church family take time to express the fact that in being a disciple of Jesus Christ, we are taught to develop a world view. What does it mean to develop a world view? One thing that we must say about the Lord Jesus Christ is that his words, his message, mission, and ministry are relevant to every generation. The Word of God is unchangeable. It's already perfect. And inasmuch as God is a perfect God, he does not need to be improved. This word that we find revealed to us in and through Jesus Christ is a word even as Christ. Jesus Christ according to Hebrews 13 and 8, is the same yesterday, today, and forever. The words that were spoken by Jesus Christ were spoken by the incarnated one who lived nearly 2,000 years ago. But it is obvious that what Jesus said then is significant, relevant, and indispensable to these present times. Jesus could not have been any more on target if he had been alive right here and right now. But the fact of the matter is he is alive and he is here right now because the Bible says Christ in you, the hope of glory. For even though the actual Rima that we find in this passage of Scripture, which is uttered by the Lord Jesus Christ two millennia ago, reflects something greater than that. The Rima is what we can hear with our ears. 
The rima is what we can print on a page, what we can speak, express, communicate, interpret, and embrace with the Holy Spirit giving us understanding. But even greater than the rima is the logos. In the beginning was the logos, or the capital W-O-R-D, for the word was with God, and the word was God. And because the word was made flesh and came and dwelt among us, then we are able to embrace it. We are able to engage it as the rima. So then, when we hear these words of Jesus Christ, it is only natural that these words would be relevant in as much as they are alive. The word, according to Hebrews 4 and 12, is alive and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit to the joints and mara, and discerns the thoughts and intents of the heart. So when Jesus speaks at all, he speaks to everyone. He does not have an esoteric message that is only designed for a select few. Rather, he speaks for the benefit of us all. That is why we find it necessary, being a follower of Christ, to develop a world view. Jesus lived by choice in a place known as Nazareth of Galilee. Nazareth was not necessarily considered to be the epicenter of the world. It was a rural place nestling on the shores of Galilee, a fishing village. And yet Jesus chooses this to be the place for his years of obscurity. You do understand that the life of Jesus Christ begins with obscurity. And as he begins his public ministry, he has a brief time of popularity before he is betrayed, denied, crucified, buried, and resurrected. If you're going to have a period of obscurity, what better place than Nazareth of Galilee. Some years ago, when we visited the nation of Israel, it was a blessing to visit the town of Nazareth. Nowadays, Nazareth has more of an Arab presence than a Jewish presence, but nothing can change the place where it is located. For the city of Nazareth, being on the shores of the Sea of Galilee is below sea level. And being below sea level, it becomes a place that is visited by many atmospheric challenges, storms that are unpredictable, that even as one seeks to cross from one side of the Sea of Galilee to the other, one never knows what will be encountered before you land on the other shore. In order to minister in Jerusalem, Jesus has always to make this climb from being below sea level in Nazareth of Galilee to being among the mountains of Jerusalem. Jesus recognizes what it means to come from the bottom destined for the top. When you know that you have to rise to the top, it acclimates you to developing a world view. Jesus does not reflect the place that he has chosen to live out the years of his obscurity. Rather, he reflects the fact that he came from heaven down, that he is God the Son, that he has love for all humankind. This is what perfects our development of a world view. For God 
so loved the world, not just Nazareth, not just Galilee, not just Israel, not just Jerusalem, not just certain ethnicities, but God so loved the world that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Developing a worldview helps us to understand how God says, all souls are mine. The soul that sinneth, it shall die. The worldview of Christ is one of compassion, of proactive evangelism. Go into all the world. Preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. He that believeth not shall be eternally condemned. Because Jesus has a world view, then there is no place where his message does not bear kingdom authority. So when we read these words of Christ in Luke chapter 11, we find the Lord Jesus Christ not only addressing his contemporary hearers, but he addresses those who are unborn for generations to come. That is the nature of the power of God's word. God's word will live forever. Jesus says, though heaven and earth shall pass away, my words shall not pass away. What does Jesus say to his generation? And what are we saying to our generation? The great hymn says, a charge to keep I have, a God to glorify, a never dying soul to save, and to fit it for the sky. God obviously gives us the opportunity to serve in a certain time and a certain place. We must engage in the stewardship of time. Jesus, according to the book of Galatians chapter 4 verse 4, was born in due time or at just the right time. He knew that he didn't have long in this physical sojourn in a body, so he did more in three and a half years in ministry than Methuselah did in 969 years of life. It is not how long one lives, it is how well one lives. It is not about quantity as much as it is about quality. And because Jesus was 100% quality, his words are relevant. Whatever situation Jesus is in, it's a blessing just to have an ear to receive the words of Jesus. He speaks justice to his generation. He says in Matthew chapter 11 that if the mighty works that he did in his hometown areas, Nazareth, even Capernaum, Chorazin, Jesus lets it be known to his contemporaries, if I had ministered like this and Sodom and Gomorrah, no doubt they would have repented in sackcloth and in ashes. But he recognized that God had suffered that he be an ambassador to an evil generation. These are relevant terms, for that is where we find ourselves now, ministering in an evil generation. Not only wars and rumors of wars, nation against nation, kingdom against kingdom, the love of many waxing cold, false prophets seducing spirits, doctrines of devils, compromising theologies, violence in the streets, a multiplication of guns, even hatred, systemic racism and bigotry. We live in an evil 
generation. But Jesus says that this generation seems to be predisposed toward seeking a sign. And the reason why they are seeking a sign is because it is a generation that is totally given over to external manifestation. They like entertainment. They like things that grab the attention. That is one thing that false prophets major in is attention-grabbing schemes. Many false prophets shall rise and shall deceive many. And if it were possible, they would deceive the very elect. For in this generation, we find that there are people with itching ears. They want you to scratch where they are itching. They want to be lullabied, lied to, deceived, and entertained. But whenever one stands behind the sacred desk, it is not entertainment hour. It is not a time for joking. It's not a time for filibustering. It is a time for declaring the full counsel of God. That is why the Apostle Peter says in 1 Peter chapter 4 verse 17, the time is come. That means here and now. That justice must begin at the house of God. Now you understand that there's something different about the house of God. You and I are blessed with domiciles in which we live. There is this space where we can refresh ourselves where we can prepare our meals, dress ourselves, where we can raise our families, teach them kingdom principles and values. There is no house in the community like the house of God. I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. But the problem that we find in this generation and even in the generation in which Christ lived with the house of God, that sometimes there were squatter spirits that had moved into God's house and had changed it from its true mission and nature. Jesus himself found in his generation that he was not even welcome in his own house. Don't you know that whenever Jesus went into the synagogue or into the temple, conflict broke out, a fight broke out? Why is it that Jesus was unwelcome in his own house? It is because there were other spirits that had moved in to the house. A classic example is in the town where Jesus lived, Nazareth of Galilee. The Bible teaches us in Luke 4 that after Jesus had fasted for 40 days and nights, that he went into the temple. And as the worship begins, Jesus is selected to bring forth the message. On this Sabbath day, Jesus is handed the scroll and he finds the place in the scroll where the Rima connects with the logos. And he reads this passage that we now know of as Isaiah 61 and 1. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the broken hearted. He has sent me to open the eyes of the blind, to preach deliverance to the captives. He has sent me to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. That's justice, brothers and sisters. When God sends you to preach good news to the poor, that's justice. Who 
receives more bad news than poor people. Shut off notices, substandard housing, densely populated communities where you are packed like sardines in a can. Yes, Jesus brings a message of comfort, a message of security, renewal, a message of hope, a message that renews our self-esteem to the poor, where there are cycles of generational poverty and generational curses. Jesus comes to break that cycle by bringing the announcement of good news from the kingdom of God. Notice how he announces this good news. He goes into the house that ought to be the headquarters for good news. The house of God should be a house of prayer. But unless God keeps the city, the watchman waketh in vain. If God does not keep the house, then it does not have any level of security. Even in the house where Jesus had grown up as a child, he found that it had lost its sense of meaning. For if anybody should have known Jesus, it should have been the people with whom he lived, the people that watched him develop, that saw him mature, that recognized the glory of God is with us. But the scripture says he came to his own and his own received him not. But to as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the children of God. Jesus then must enter into the house knowing that he is reinforced by an angelic presence. He must come into the house knowing that though he is being sent as lambs among wolves, that the enemy cannot destroy his message, his mission, or his ministry. For when Jesus has read Isaiah 61, as it is recorded in Luke chapter 4, verses 16 through 20, he then causes the scroll to be returned to the minister. And then he looks them into their very souls and says to his contemporaries, his generation, this day is this scripture fulfilled in your ears. Well, when Jesus says that, there is a pause for station identification. And as he pauses for station identification, he realizes this is not really God's house. It looks like God's house. It looks like a place of worship. But because there are spirits there that are ungodly, that are anti-kingdom, when Jesus says these words, they are filled with hatred and rejection. The Bible says the people in that synagogue pushed him to the brow of the hill to throw him down headlong. But because he is the Messiah, because he is the anointed one, then that means he can find his way through the valley of the shadow of death. The anointing is a lubricant that you receive when you have smashed the olive. God lubricates us because he understands that in times you will be surrounded by opposition and haters and people that want to destroy you. But because God has the all upon your life, he will slip you right through the sticky fingers of death. Jesus knows that this is a mob crowd that wants to rise not simply against him, but against God's kingdom. But Jesus walks through the midst of them, and they can't even destroy him. Don't you realize that when Jesus goes to the temple, the same thing happens again, even as they try to stone him because of his proclamation of truth? This is an evil generation. They seek entertainment. They seek a sign. Even Satan said, show them a sign. 
go to the pinnacle of the temple and jump down so that angels can bear you up in their hands because it is written that the angels have charge concerning you that if you dash your foot against a stone they'll bear you up in their hands or command these stones to be made into bread or get down on your knees and worship me so I can give you the kingdoms of the world. Isn't Satan a smooth liar? He's going to tell the one who made the world, the king of kings and lord of lords, I'm going to give you kingdoms. That sounds like the liars on January 6th in the Capitol building who saw a riot and insurrection take place and then later they deny that it even happened. We have that kind of spirit of fabrication, confusion, deceit, and falsehood in this nation. The same kind of generation that Jesus preached to is the one that we live in. Jesus brought the message home. I want to see if the message is embraced in the house of God. If they don't accept it at Nazareth, I'll move my headquarters to Capernaum. When he went to Capernaum, it was obvious that the demons were there sitting, waiting for him to come in. Moss-back demons who had been there for years, daring the Spirit of God to be at work. There are still praise haters in the places of worship. Praise fighters, praise busters, people that don't want to see the hand of God at work, that don't want to see the glory of God revealed or the power of God manifested. But God is God all by himself, even in Capernaum as Jesus walks in. A demon confronts him. He wants Jesus to know, I don't like it that you are here. And I know who you are. You are Jesus of Nazareth. And because of it, Jesus had to silence that demon. Even though you are a squatter in God's house, even though you abuse and take advantage of God's people, you have a spirit of destroying children's minds, stealing their innocence and their future. I'm not going to suffer you to be a squatter any longer in my father's house. Jesus took authority over that demon and cast him out. Don't you understand that in order for justice to be engaged, it must have a place that it can call home. Why is justice unwelcome in the house of God? It is often unwelcome because it's not even at home behind the sacred desk. If justice cannot be preached, if justice cannot be taught, if justice cannot be modeled by those who are charged with with preaching the gospel, then it has no home in the pews, in the faith community, and even less in the streets of the city. It is impossible for us to see the world in the condition that it is in and not take some responsibility for it ourselves. We cannot blame the ills of society on a political system. We can't put all the blame upon a certain political party. We cannot point fingers of accusation at those who engage in ungodly industries, activities, or even strongholds because God has entrusted us with kingdom authority. That is why we preach Christ and him crucified. The reason why we preach Christ because it is still a life-changing message. There is no message that grapples with the ills of our society like the gospel of Jesus Christ. There is no word that soothes our sorrows, binds our broken hearts, lifts up our bowed-down heads like the gospel of Jesus Christ. And that is why the enemy hates the gospel of Jesus Christ. 
There is no message that is more fought against than the gospel of Jesus Christ. But even though it is a message that is hated by the world, Paul says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ, for it is the dunamis of God, the exousia. It is the power of God unto salvation and everyone that believes. You've got to develop a comfort level with preaching a message that is hated, a message that is rejected, a message that the world refuses. But never allow rejection to discourage your ministry. You got to learn how to live with rejection. And not only live with rejection, you got to learn how to shout in rejection. You got to be strong enough to cut your step in rejection. Because remember, God loves you. And he loves you unconditionally. And he loves you with an everlasting love. The love of Jesus secures my soul. The love of Jesus renews my strength, restores my soul. And just to know that Jesus loves me gives me holy boldness. To know that Jesus loves me means that God will fight our battles. You've got to learn to live with rejection. Jesus was better than you and I will ever be. Jesus, the spotless lamb of God. Jesus, no guile found in his mouth. Immaculately conceived, tempted as we are, yet without sin. Jesus lived a perfect life, but he was still rejected. He was still hated. He was still persecuted. Oh, Lord. But Jesus learned to live with rejection. Even the psalmist wrote a song about rejection. For he said in Psalm 118, the stone that the builders rejected has become the headstone of the corner. If God wants you to be blessed, rejection can't stop you. If God wants you to succeed. Opposition can't stop you. If God wants you to flourish, he'll make you like a tree planted by the rivers of waters. Bring forth your fruit in your season. Your leaves shall not wither. And whatever you do shall prosper. Oh, Yes, Jesus lived with rejection. For the Bible says in Isaiah 53, who has believed our report? And to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant and as a root out of dry ground. Dry ground represents rejection. Dry ground means even the rain won't fall. Dry ground means that even the dew has not favored me. Dry ground means the door are shut in my face. Dry ground means that we are trouble on every side, but not distressed, persecuted, but not destroyed, cast down. Hallelujah. But God keeps on raising me back up. Hallelujah. 
rejection mean that your message is relevant for judgment begins in God's house not the courthouse not the jailhouse, not city hall, not the state house, not the white house, but judgment begins at God's house. For the prophet Amos said, let justice roll down like waters and righteousness as a mighty stream. The world cannot get better until justice reigns in the house of God. Cities cannot shake off violence, poverty, substandard housing, substandard education until justice reigns in the house of God. That means you got to welcome Jesus in his own house. Jesus, you are welcome in your house because I see you and I hear you saying, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. I've been put out of my own church, put out of my own worship experience, put out of my own house, cold hearts, stiff necks, pride and arrogance has shut God out of his own house, but it's still the house of God because the cattle of a thousand hills belong to him. Silver and gold belong to him. Houses and land belong to him. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. God still said, I want to get back in. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anybody, if a child, if a boy or girl, man or woman, would just hear my voice, oh, I will come in and sup with him and hear with me. Let Jesus into your heart. Let Jesus into your worship. Let Jesus into your praise. Let Jesus into your life. Welcome, Holy Spirit. Welcome, joy. Welcome, peace. Welcome, healing. Welcome, deliverance. Welcome, justice. Welcome, truth. Welcome, praise for the more praises go up, the more blessings will come down. Let the church welcome her Lord and Savior. Let the church welcome signs and wonders. Let the church welcome the power of the Holy Ghost as the day of Pentecost. God had to signify a change in the atmosphere. The Bible says there came a sound from heaven as a rushing mighty wind. Sometime God has to shake up things. Sometime God has to shake out things. Sometime God has to remove that which is stagnant, that which is stale, that which is toxic, and then bring in a breath of fresh air. Come, Holy Spirit, come, cloven tongues like a fire. Come, baptism of the Holy Ghost. Come, power of the living God. Mm. Oh, Lord. And when you come, bring justice with you until every mountain and hill is made low. When justice comes, every valley shall be exalted. When justice comes, the crooked 
shall be made straight and the rough places shall be made smooth when justice come the glory of the Lord shall be revealed glory will fill our soul glory will heal our bodies glory will cast the devil out glory will pause miracles to take place glory 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 oh yes glory glory thank you Jesus for when Jesus was born, there was an angelic host, and with the angelic host, an angel announced glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace and goodwill to humankind. When the glory comes, the Shekinah glory of God, that's when justice shows up. That's when the playing field is level. That's when there is no difference between the Jew and the Greek. No difference between the bond and the free. No discrimination between male and female because we all one in Jesus Christ. Glory means that God has leveled the playing field. Glory means that there are no big eyes and little U's. Glory means that everybody is welcome at God's table. Glory means that God offers a universal invitation. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden. I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. This is Bishop J. Lewis Felton thanking you for joining us for the Mount Airy Kingdom Worship Experience. May you continue to partner with us as we share the gospel of Jesus Christ throughout the world. We love you in Jesus' name.